The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario declared its first pandemic state of emergency due to a novel coronavirus called COVID-19 on this day two years ago. And while it all seemed entirely new to us, tonight, epidemiologist Dan Werb explains the long history of the coronavirus as a repeat offender that could have been thwarted. Then, ahead of Ontario's shift next month to allow online gambling, why Indigenous operators see the move as an abject betrayal. It's Thursday, March 17th, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. Two years ago, when the world was hit with a novel coronavirus, it was just one of a few times that humans have come into contact with this pathogen. Or was it? Dan Werb is an epidemiologist and assistant professor at the University of Toronto and University of California, San Diego. His new book maps the path that brought COVID-19 into our lives. It's called The Invisible Siege, The Rise of Coronaviruses and the Search for a Cure. And he joins us now from St. Michael's Hospital in the downtown core of Ontario's capital city to explain this mystery. Dan, it's great to have you on the program. How are you managing? I'm well, I'm well. Thanks for having me back. Not at all. Here we go. Let's go back to 2003. This is from your book. The revelation you write that SARS was a coronavirus had implications that went far deeper than the epidemic the world faced in 2003. Coronaviruses were simply not a threat to humans, and they were certainly not supposed to be capable of producing strains that infected 8,000 people across the globe and killed roughly 10% of them. In the world of virology, coronaviruses were docile creatures, known for causing common colds and infecting animals. They had, as far as anyone knew, never been anything but a largely innocuous family. Okay, Dan, SARS took us by surprise in 2003, but you think it shouldn't have, right? Was this not its first appearance? Yeah, so at the time when SARS emerged, there were two known coronaviruses that could infect humans. And, and as you read in that excerpt, um, they both caused just common colds. Um, it seemed like a very stable family, a family that didn't change much. Uh, and that, you know, even when SARS emerged, uh, which we thought of as the first, you know, pathogenic human coronavirus, it was understood as kind of a, just an aberration of nature, just something that was uh, entirely um, you know, a coincidence um, and not some kind of uh, comment or, or reflection on the ability of the, of the family to jump from species to species and to become dangerous. Now, in the wake of SARS, there was some really interesting work done um, by scientists using something called molecular clock analysis, which is basically a way to th go through the speed of mutations that viruses um, uh, produce and kind of follow the thread of mutations back to the moment when a particular viral strain first branched off from its closest relative. And using this technique, uh, coronavirologists went back and discovered that there was one of these known uh, coronaviruses that uh, now in, you know, just only cause common colds had actually emerged in the 1890s. Uh, and they pinpointed the date to, you know, the end of uh, between 1889 and 1890. Now, what's remarkable about that moment in time is that it's exactly when something called the Russian flu pandemic swept across the globe. And this was a pandemic that uh, killed a million people. Uh, and as its name suggests, it was commonly understood to be a flu. Uh, and it was only much later uh, after uh, the advent of SARS, that it seems like that was potentially actually a coronavirus pandemic in disguise. How shocking a revelation was this to you and your colleagues? Uh, I, I, I think it's it's pretty shocking. And, and, you know, the further back you go with molecular clock analysis, you understand that, um, you know, the history of this vir viral family isn't counted in you know, thousands of years or 10,000s of years as, as it was commonly uh, believed. It actually potentially goes back as many as 300 million years. And that's a long time. And that's far, far before our species ever walked the earth. And so that suggests that, 
you know, rather than being something entirely new, coronaviruses might actually predate our own species and that we're, you know, living in a coronavirus world and we just happen to show up in it. So we're, boy, this reminds me of an old episode of Star Trek. We're the viruses and they're actually the legit normal thing? Well, what's remarkable about coronaviruses is that, you know, rather than being these uh, stable, species-specific viruses, again, in the wake of SARS, some coronavirologists started to look at the capacity of these viruses to jump between species. And they found that rather than being stable, rather than being species-specific, coronaviruses are actually incredible generalists. Now, what that means is they're able to uh, uh, take advantage of the same kinds of um, weaknesses and vulnerabilities that exist in a number of different species. And so, you know, for example, they to enter cells, uh, coronaviruses, um, you know, they essentially use their spike protein. The spike protein is engineered, you know, by nature to um, uh, to um, engage with a particular part of the cell wall. And and what's incredible is that this that part of the cell wall that a number of different coronaviruses attack is something that is common across not only human beings, but across mice, but across a number of bat species. And so what you realize is that, you know, coronavirus, coronaviruses have actually been working on kind of picking the locks of our cells, not just uh, among humans, but among our ancestors for, again, for hundreds of millions of years, potentially. Um, and so when humans arrived on the scene, they were already primed to take advantage of the weaknesses in our in our system that had been there um, since before our species existed and were there with our ancestors. Okay, you mentioned Russia uh, a moment ago, a million deaths there. Take us back a thousand years to China. What did you find there? Yeah, so, you know, it's a, it, again, using this molecular clock analysis, um, there, there was another um, coronavirus strain called NL63 that, you know, nowadays, again, just causes a common cold. But using this molecular clock analysis, it was uh, uh, identified that it first emerged around a thousand years ago. And you know, the further back in time you get with molecular clock analysis, the the fuzzier the estimates are. So you know, for this book that I wrote, The Invisible Siege, that that chronicles sort of the rise of the coronavirus family and then the scientific response to it, leading into SAR, uh, into um, COVID nineteen and beyond. I went back and, and looked at, okay, what was happening in the 11th century um, when this uh, NL63 was first believed to have emerged? And again, when viruses first emerge and, and uh, intersect with new species, it's often when they're, you know, they, they're often not well um, uh, engineered to, to, uh, to replicate within those systems without damaging their hosts. So that's a fancy way of saying they basically cause more dangerous outcomes. Now, what was going on in the 11th century, which is fascinating, is that China uh, had, had emerged from hundreds of years of chaos into this dynasty called the Northern Song, which was sort of a high point of Chinese um, culture, economy, um, sophistication, and um, international trading. And it was also a point in time when 80 years of extreme epidemics racked the country. And so I went back and I looked at, um, you know, extant notes from physicians at the time, from uh, policies from, uh, that were recorded by the Chinese court, and discovered that there were a number of these epidemics that caused symptoms very similar to what a coronavirus is known to, to um, cause. And so, you know, it's far, far back in time. We will never know for sure whether it was a coronavirus that caused these, this wave of decades of, of um, you know, epidemics. Um, but it certainly seems like it could have been the case. And, and it's also sort of, I would say, a cautionary tale in what happens to societies when epidemics are uh, able to to just run unchecked, uh, and I'll I'll save you the spoiler, um, <laughs> you know the epidemics uh, ended up you know lasting longer than the Northern Song Dynasty itself. Hmm. Well, uh, if you want to talk about a cautionary tale, a lot of people regard SARS 
from 2003 as a sort of a dress rehearsal for what we're going through right now. So let's follow up on that. You make the comparison in the book about how countries that did experience SARS, like ours, formed a kind of a scar tissue that countries that didn't experience it, like the United States, um, that they didn't make. Why is that a significant distinction to make? Yeah, I, I, I think it's very, very significant. And this idea of scar tissue, you know, that points to trauma. SARS was a national trauma for Canada. It was a national trauma for China. It was a national trauma for Australia, um, Vietnam. These were all countries that were deeply affected by SARS that saw normal life um, basically brought to a standstill in a lot of parts of the country. And I'll give you the, uh, you know, the example of Canada. In the wake of SARS, the Public Health Agency of Canada was formed. It was part of the um, sort of, you know, audit on what went wrong and what went right with SARS. And it was it was decided that Canada needed a public health agency that could act very rapidly, very nimbly, and act flexibly to counteract a pathogenic threat if and when it emerged. Um, along with uh, the the implementation of the Public Health Agency of Canada, there was also legislation passed that increased the power of medical officers of health to direct resources, to impose restrictions. And, you know, we've seen all of that come into play uh, in the response to COVID. And I would say early on, particularly, if you look at those countries that experienced the trauma of SARS, and in the case of South Korea, experienced another coronavirus epidemic in Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, they were very, very well equipped to deal with the initial outbreaks and the initial epidemics through public health measures that they were able to rapidly uh, implement. And, and that's directly related to the fact that, you know, we went through this already as a country with SARS and we knew how, how serious uh, things could get. I, I'd like to follow up with the story of Ian Lipkin, who was the scientist who, I gather, invented the PCR test in the middle of the SARS crisis. We're going back to 2003. And you tell the story about how he was immediately flown to China to sort of show public officials, public health officials there, how to administer it, how to make it work. What do you think his experience 19 years ago taught us for today? So Ian Lipkin is a is a fascinating guy. Um, he so he didn't invite invent the PCR test writ large. He he invented this PCR test specific to detecting SARS. Um, he's better known in sort of a pop culture zeitgeist as the scientific consultant on the movie Contagion. So uh, if you like that, you you saw a little bit of Ian Lipkin in there. So Ian Lipkin, um, you know, was at the time one of, and, and is still one of the world's foremost um, epidemic scientists, pathogenic scientists, and, and had uh, early on in the epidemic sought to create this PCR test, this very, um, you know, highly granular, sensitive test that could detect SARS. Up until that point, um, there was no way to know who was being infected with SARS reliably. There were some early tests that, um, you know, sort of got halfway there, but there was no reliable test for, for SARS. And without a test, as we've all learned, you can't control an epidemic. If you don't know who has, who, who has been infected, you cannot impose restrictions. You cannot place people in quarantine. You can't do contact tracing and all of the kinds of things that are required to um, make sure that an outbreak doesn't metastasize into an epidemic and an epidemic transform into a pandemic. So early on um, in, in the SARS epidemic, Ian Lipkin created this new PCR test and was immediately flown to, Be to Beijing by the Chinese government, where he was put on national TV and had to demonstrate on national TV to you know, the entire Chinese populace um, that the tests actually worked and how to use them. And the introduction of that PCR test was along with some really incredible public health work done by the Chinese government at the time, um, you know, really consequential in turning the tide. And SARS, of course, didn't require a vaccine uh, to uh, stamp it out. Um, it was, we were able to draw, drive SARS back into the wild using only public health restrictions. There were never any vaccines uh, created to counteract uh, SARS. There were never any treatments that were developed to make people who were infected less ill. It was just purely public health um, measures, and they were powered in large part by accurate tests. Let's pivot to the business of infectious disease. And again, I'm going to read an excerpt from your book to get us started on this. 
By the 1950s, you write, morphine, penicillin, aspirin, insulin, and chemotherapy, along with vaccines for polio, measles, smallpox, and tuberculosis, had been developed by, or in partnership with, private pharmaceutical companies. But the sheer glut of life-saving medicines they produced in the first half of the 20th century left them with a choice. Either take a chance on more difficult goals, like vaccines for rare or emerging diseases, and risk costly failures, or use their library of intellectual property to make incremental improvements to existing products that were sure-fire moneymakers. By and large, they chose the safer route. For all humanity's awe-inspiring discoveries, our capacity to meet new viral threats had largely calcified in the face of ruthless market forces. Which raises the question, how do we get pharmaceutical companies to keep researching for vaccines um, if we find ourselves in the future not quite in the desperate circumstances we found ourselves in two years ago this week? It's a great question. And I think it's among the most consequential questions of our age. So, you know, I was speaking with a scientist, uh, uh, you know, last year, and he posed the question, what would you have paid me for a COVID vaccine in January 2018? The answer is nothing. Right. Because there was no SARS-CoV-2. There was zero incentive in the market to project out into the future to address threats that didn't yet exist. That's not the, far, that, that, that's not the, the fault of um, pharmaceutical companies. That's simply the way that our system for making science uh, works. So I, I don't want to, um, you know, demonize pharmaceutical companies, um, but obviously the way in which scientific research happens in the for-profit arena doesn't make sense. We have a collective action problem here, like so many of the problems that we're facing as a species. It is a collective action problem insofar as everybody agrees that there will be another pandemic potential pathogen that emerges. And it, and, and we also know that it's going to emerge from one of the 26 viral families that are known to infect human beings. Mm. However, there's no agreement in developing vaccines or treatments that can deal with any of, uh, you know, strains from any of those viral families until they emerge. And that's, you know, on the flip side, we have still hundreds, hundreds, almost 300 pharmaceutical companies, research groups, biotech companies trying to develop a COVID vaccine now. So what's the alternative? So the alternative is to develop and support public science. I mean, publicly funded science got us so far of the way in, um, in, in our response to COVID-19. And the thing about publicly funded science is that, you know, people are always saying, you know, or not people, often politicians, when they're upset with uh, scientific funding, saying, oh, why, why are we studying this mosquito? Or why are we studying this um, arcane sort of benign viral family that has never been known to infect humans or cause them harm? Well, the reason is because we never know what's going to happen in the future. And so we need to take a broad approach and allow sort of the marketplace of ideas to proliferate um, based on good ideas and creative thinking rather than on what is going to be um, as profitable as possible in the short term. It's really the only way. So there, I mean, there's a few specific strategies by which you can do that. The first is, as I said, um, you can create vaccines for one strain of each of the 26 viral families known to infect humans. That That is, you know, they call these kinds of things a moonshot, right? It is a large job, but it's not an impossibly large job. I mean, it's it's constrained insofar as we know that there's only these many families, and all we would need is one vaccine that works against one strain of each of those families, and we would be so well positioned at that point if a new pathogen emerged from one of those families to adapt the existing vaccine to that pathogen. So that's that's one way of doing it. The other way, and of course, that would have to be a publicly funded global effort. The other way to do that is to um, look at um, broad-based antiviral medicines and try to develop as many broad-based antiviral medicines as possible that can protect our species from existing viruses 
and future viruses. So I'll give you an example. There is this drug molnupiravir, which uh, is one of the uh, FDA in the States, FDA approved drugs for uh, you know, disrupting the replication of um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Molnupiravir was developed and tested beginning in 2015. And it wasn't tested against SARS-CoV-2, of course, because the virus didn't yet exist. It was tested as a pan-coronavirus weapon. It was something that the people testing it realized, you know, it's, it, it is um, able to disrupt a particular part of the viral replication cycle. And that part of the viral replication cycle is undertaken and is pretty much exactly the same across every single coronavirus strain out there. And at that point, there were hundreds of coronavirus strains that had been detected. All of them had this particular um, uh, non-structural protein as part of their genome that was similar and was uh, able to be disrupted by molnupiravir. And so at the time, the thinking was, okay, well, if this drug works to inhibit replication among all these coronaviruses, it's almost certainly going to work against a future coronavirus. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Let me ask you about the scientists that you followed who were committed to this notion of open science. And I'm wondering how much success they had in those efforts. Yeah, um, so there's two scientists of note. Um, the first, I would say, is, is Bob Brunham, who was part of Canada's uh, vaccine task force uh, and was one of the most consequential scientists working around SARS. So. Brunham was uh, the director of the BC um, Center uh, for Disease Control at the time in Vancouver when SARS emerged. And he was part of a team that first mapped the SARS genome. And at the time, it was this incredible, incredible accomplishment because mapping genomes took uh, weeks, months, if not years. And uh, Dr. Brunham and his colleagues were able to do it in just a matter of about two weeks. And you know, going back to the test that uh, Ian Lipkin produced, this PCR test, that PCR test was programmed on the genome map that Dr. Brunham uh, produced. And, and Lipkin describes the work of Dr. Brunham and his colleagues at UBC as a heroic effort. And in fact, you know, what's amazing is that when they announced their um, findings that they had mapped the genome, this, the US Centers for Disease Control, one of the best funded bodies doing this work uh, in the world, uh, announced their that they had mapped the genome 24 hours later. So this small group in Vancouver actually beat the US CDC in mapping the genome. Hmm. Now, in the wake of um, mapping the genome, Dr. Brunham wanted to kind of capitalize on that and had this vision of creating a um, decentralized open science vaccine initiative called uh, SAVI. It was called the SARS Accelerated Vaccine Initiative. And it worked on an open science principle where nothing would be patented and it was decentralized to speed things up. And, and at the time, you know, vaccine production took about 10 years, if you were lucky, to get one from sort of um, conception to the market. And Dr. Brunham thought, well, I, I think we can do this in like 18 months. Um, so he produced this or, or developed this, um, this vaccine initiative where there were multiple groups, multiple laboratories, all working on different vaccine initiatives, different vaccine um, uh, candidates. And Whoever landed on the right candidate, it didn't matter because everybody would, would share in the spoils. It didn't matter whether your lab specifically landed on the right candidate. And in that way, in that kind of like holistic, comprehensive and open way, they were able to generate three really, really impressive vaccine candidates for SARS. Um, now, the problem was they had to wait to get it into human clinical trials. To do that, they had to wait for another SARS wave. And ironically, because Dr. Brunham and his team had mapped the genome, which allowed the production of this incredible PCR test to detect SARS, that had allowed public health officials to completely reduce the outbreak and eventually drive SARS back to the wild. And so the excellence of Dr. Brunham's initial mapping of the genome meant that there was no future waves of SARS. And without future waves of SARS, there were no uh, humans to test the vaccine on. And unfortunately, that is the key reason why that open science vaccine initiative never got off the ground. Um, but it wasn't because the idea 
wasn't a good one. And in fact, you know, nowadays when we look at vaccine distribution, we can see, or, you know, for the COVID-19 vaccines, there's still under 15% of people in low-income countries that have had one dose. Right. One dose. Hmm. And so the notion that the vaccines are going to end the global pandemic has been shown to be totally wrong. I mean, it's, again, the cruelty of the open market, uh, of the for-profit market, has just created conditions by which we have a complete, you know, uh, uh, dis distinction between what's happening in rich countries and what's happening in low-income countries. And unfortunately, it's only through open science and, uh, you know, open, non-patentable, um, non-for-profit um, approaches that we're going to be able to see vaccine uh, equity. And that is key to ending the pandemic for everyone. Indeed. Dan, I wonder, let, let's just finish up on this. You know, scientists have been well, they have really thrown themselves into the whole moonshot thing. And we have, as you just pointed out, brought this thing to market, numerous uh, different uh, brands of vaccines uh, that might have taken a decade instead took much less time. Do you think there will also be residual knowledge uh, that has come forward as a result of our fight against coronaviruses that can be used for other things in the future? Absolutely. So, you know, on the one hand, directly, we have tested now these antivirals against coronaviruses, and we now see that they're effective against yet the latest SAR, uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. So that sets us up well, if there is a future coronavirus pathogen that emerges, um, to use antivirals immediately and early to ensure that outbreaks don't spread. Okay, so that's that's number one. The, the other way is that I think... Um, it, it, the the knowledge and the the safety and efficacy data that has come particularly from mRNA vaccines is instantly translatable to efforts to create vaccines elsewhere. And in fact, just today, Moderna uh, released some really, really promising results for an HIV vaccine, which uses mRNA technologies. Mm -hmm. So you're already seeing this blowback into HIV, one of the most difficult to vaccinate against viruses that we know. Um, you know, I've also spoken with scientists who have suggested specifically on the on the issue of HIV, which is, you know, of course, a massive pandemic for which we have no vaccine, that the work around developing a COVID-19 vaccine has moved HIV vaccinology forward 10 years. So there's all this incredible eruption of scientific discovery and exploration and all these new tools and technologies that have been validated that can immediately be put to good use against other uh, uh, viruses. Of course, we need to be focused on the future, right? And we need to be focused on not only the viruses that currently bedevil our species, but also those that are yet to emerge. Dan Werb has been our guest. The Invisible Siege, The Rise of Coronaviruses and the Search for a Cure. What a fascinating book. So good of you to spend so much time with us here on TVO tonight, Dan. Many thanks. Thanks for having me. Are you confused about COVID? Some doctors in the Family and Community Medicine Department at the U of T think you might be. So they've put together a website to answer some of the questions you may have. The website is available at confusedaboutcovid.ca. And to learn more about it, we're joined by Dr. Danielle Martin, academic family physician and chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. And she joins us in her office at Women's College Hospital in the downtown core of Ontario's capital city. Dr. Martin, great to see you again. How are you managing? Great to see you, Steve. Thanks. I'm managing pretty well, but it's been uh, a busy time for me as for so many others across the healthcare system over these last many weeks. So Absolutely. we were happy to have a chance to play our part in trying to cut through some of the confusion out there. Well, tell me, why, let's start there. Why did you think a website like this was necessary? Well, this wave of COVID, more than any of the previous waves, this Omicron wave, is really playing out in the community. I'm sure that every single person watching uh, today has uh, either had a COVID infection or knows someone personally who's been infected with COVID during this last uh, wave. And the, con and the information out there can be really confusing. And so what we're seeing in our offices as family doctors is just a lot of uh, phone calls, messages, emails, people coming in trying to understand, should I be rapid testing or shouldn't I be rapid testing? 
Do I self-isolate for five days or 10 days? How do I self-isolate in my household? Uh, how do I know when I'm ready to come out of quarantine? How do I care for my child with COVID? All of these questions that uh, as the infection uh, numbers are so, so high in the community, we are being flooded with these questions in family medicine, which is, of course, what your family doctor is there for. Uh, but nevertheless, we felt it was important that we come forward as a discipline. And so we just, we've partnered up with the Ontario College of Family Physicians and we've put these resources out uh, to answer some of those very common questions that we're seeing in our own practices. And we're pleased to say that these resources are also available on our website in French, and we have uh, five more languages coming soon. I guess before we actually show people the site, I should ask you, I was going to ask you whether you're surprised two years into this thing that people still have so many basic questions, but maybe the better question is, are you depressed about the fact that two years into this, people are still asking some of these most basic questions? I have to say that in the process of writing these, uh, we got confused more than once ourselves. Um, you know, part of this is the guidance keeps changing. And that is understandable as we learn more, as the pandemic shifts around us, the advice is different from day to day. Um, and, and some of it is also relates to we have never seen before over the course of the, of the pandemic, this many people being infected at this rate, many of whom are uh, previously vaccinated, but some of whom might not be. And so the advice really differs depending on your circumstance. And so, I mean, I'm depressed, I suppose, Steve, in the sense that you know, we all wish we weren't having to still be dealing with these questions and able to, to move on. Uh, and certainly it's not how any of us imagined we would, we would be spending our time as family doctors, you know, this much of our effort going into immunization and uh, management of COVID in our own practices. But nevertheless, I think that um, this information is helpful and it certainly does feel necessary. Well, let's take a look, shall we? I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, if he would, to go on the website confusedaboutcovid.ca. There we go. And let's scroll down because that's sort of the title page. Then we get to a bunch of boxes with a bunch of very typical questions. Let's click on the one. I'm worried about the new variant. How do I keep safe during Omicron? And again, people can scroll down and there you've got a lot of very useful information about what you can in fact do to stay safe during Omicron. Now, let me ask you this. People are getting information from all over the place why should they trust this information more than what they see somewhere else? Well, this information is brought to you by the Family Doctors of Ontario. So if you trust your own family doctor or nurse practitioner, your own primary care provider, if you would trust the advice that you would get from them, uh, you know that that is who has put this uh, information together. And we've done it using the best available evidence, drawing from public health guidance and provincial and national guidance but also interpreting it, you know, which is what we do in our offices every day. In family medicine, we try to take what can be pretty complicated uh, guideline type advice and distill it down to what are the critical things that you need to know in your current life circumstance. And uh, so we're not inventing this stuff. It's not new information. It's information that has been collated, pulled together and synthesized in a way that we believe speaks to the questions that we hear from our own patients every day. Okay, I don't have to tell you that people are mistrustful of a lot of people that they used to consider authorities on various things, but do you feel that family docs during the course of the last two years during this pandemic still are basically trusted by their patients? Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, I suppose it would be better to ask the patients that, but I will say in my own practice as a family doctor, um, that this is when we can be most useful and helpful to our patients. Um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in the earlier phases of this pandemic relying on assessment centers uh, to uh, carry out swabbing and testing and mass immunization clinics to carry out immunization. And family doctors were participating in all of that work. Uh, we were all out there participating in outreach to shelters and uh, immunization clinics in, you know, strip malls and uh, doing what we could to participate. But we're now in a new phase. And in this phase, coming back to that relationship that you have with the person who is your navigator through your healthcare journey, uh, which is your family doctor or your primary care provider, um, is really important. And I think that we, uh, as we look to the post-pandemic healthcare system, 
uh, rebuilding those relationships is going to be even more critical. I am going to be so bold as to say that I bet one thing that does depress you and has depressed you during the course of the past two years is that many people, many of our friends, are just as happy to take medical advice from some quack on Facebook as they are from a family doctor that they've been going to for decades. In which case, what prospects do you think your website can have fighting so much mis- and disinformation that's out there? I mean, I, I don't think that uh, we're here to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, somebody and, you know, posting stuff on Facebook from their, their mom's basement. You know, our, our job is to um, bring forward our own expertise and evidence and to rely on the relationships that we have with people over time. Um, I will say, Steve, honestly, that we see so many people who bring into us what it is that they're reading to ask for help interpreting it, that I think it's not a question of trying to erase all of these other sources of information, but most people will trust the healthcare provider who knows them best to help them to interpret what does this mean for me. And whether that's an article that you read in People magazine or whether it's a post that you read online, if you're not sure whether something is for real, uh, and uh, that is exactly the role of, of your primary care provider is to help you to sort through the mess of information out there and help you understand what's most relevant to you. Sometimes what you read on the internet might be based in fact, but we all know that sometimes it might not be. Dr. Danielle Martin, we are always grateful for your appearances on our program. We'll remind people, confusedaboutcovid.ca is your latest contribution to the fight against COVID-19. Thanks for taking the time to spend with us tonight here on TVO. Thanks, Steve. If all goes according to plan, Ontario will launch online gaming this April. The government says it will bring a grey market in internet gambling into the open. Chief Kelly LaRocca represents the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, which is invested in the Great Blue Heron Casino and Hotel, and they call this move a slap in the face and worse. And Chief LaRocca joins us now from Port Perry, Ontario. Chief, always good to have you on our program. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Not at all. Give us your understanding of what you believe will be the new situation in Ontario as of April 4th when online gaming goes on. Well, according to the province's plan, the provincial iGaming or internet gaming scheme will fundamentally change gaming in Ontario. Gone will be any hope of responsible gaming. Gone will be any limits on the number of gaming sites or gaming positions in Ontario. The iGaming platform will bring gaming into the, li the living rooms of Ontarians, um, allowing nearly anyone with access to the internet to gamble. It, in my view, will amount to, as well, a complete saturation of gambling across the province and basically will kill the already tenuous economy of economies of First Nations. So basically, in my view, it's critical that the province meets its duty to meaningfully consult First Nations and accommodate First Nations. Municipalities and operators, well, they have no voice because they're not owed any constitutional uh, protected duty of consultation. The values of First Nations include responsible gaming and a measured capacity for growth. These are values that, in my view, are similarly held by the majority of Ontarians across the province. So, though a death nail to First Nations, the major concerns of transparency and public safety with the iGaming initiative are really shared province-wide. Okay, you've raised a bunch of issues there, and let's uh, sort of pick them off one by one. And to start with, uh, I want to talk about the issue of whether or not, uh, I guess, the impact that, that this new iGaming would have on you. And to that end, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this up from the Toronto Star, and we'll get this on the record from earlier this year. The Star reported, Great Canadian Gaming which operates 12 casinos in the province, including in Woodbine and Pickering, commissioned a report late last year that it recently shared with the government. It said online sites would, quote, cannibalize the profits of brick and mortar casinos and predicts about 2,600 lost casino jobs and 2.8 billion less in tax revenue over five years if Ontario opens up the market as planned. Can I just get your take first, Chief Laraka, on... Um what you think of that report? Well, firstly, I'm glad it was commissioned. I think, um, obviously, as an operator with 70% of the uh, 
operator market in the province, Great Canadian Gaming has a lot to be concerned about right now. Um, certainly uh, there, there are concerns that are echoed on our behalf, given that they operate the Great, Great Blue Heron. I, uh, I haven't seen any such reporting from the province. I don't know where the data is from their end, and if they have it, then it's certainly not been transparently shared. Um, in my view, there's there's a lot to lose. You know, as you mentioned, uh, we are we have a stake in the Great Blue Heron. More than 25 years ago, our community took a huge risk to build that Great Blue Heron casino, and it remains basically the lifeblood to our First Nations economy. And our First Nation continues to be a major financial contributor to all of the surrounding community and other First Nations. That investment enabled us to finally lift our long-term boil water advisory, which I've been on your show to speak with you about at previous times. It provides housing, healthcare, education, and it's really quite critical to preserving our cultural community. Um, for decades, the province has defended its monopoly on gaming, going so far as to pursue criminal charges against other Indigenous governments who sought to participate in gaming on their own land. And then now in a stunning reversal, they're creating an open market for iGaming in the province, contrary to their own previous efforts to maintain unlimited market size. So they're offering a great deal to companies who have the money to participate in a government-approved iGaming sector. After years of blocking First Nations and others from entering the gaming industry, their, um, again, their iGaming model was, was announced with any prior consultation by the province, period. The Ford regime has yet again shown a wanton disregard, in my view, for the contractual obligations of the province. It's time that they abandon their typical approach of shooting first and asking questions later and take note of reports such as uh, that commissioned by Great Canadian Gaming. We all deserve a, a well thought out plan before they come to launch their iGaming program in April. And let's just do a quick history lesson here because once upon a time, as you just pointed out, your First Nation owned and operated the Great Blue Heron, isn't that right? Yes. And then you lost yes. the ability to do that at what point? Well, it was a bit of a slow burn. We we opened it up in 19, um, I believe it was 1997, and I believe the slots were uh, put in by the OLG into the Great Blue Heron in the year 2000. And we really noticed at that point an economic boom in our casino. Clearly, the slots were a necessary ingredient for success, uh, although our tables in, um, have a long-standing patronage that... Um, is responsibly enjoyed. But um, our First Nation, yes, operated the facility as a hybrid facility. It was the only one of its kind. We operated the tables whilst the OLG operated the slots. And, or I should say, we both operated it under a, a combined operator, which at the time was uh, Casinos Austria. So we operated that um, tickety-boo until I'd say in and around 2014, I believe it was slightly before that, that the OLG modernized or up announced its approach to modernization of gaming in the province, which is basically privatization of gaming. And they were putting quite an amount of pressure on us to um, get into the modernization scheme with them um, rather than um, sort of operating on our own because the threat of them building up other land-based gaming facilities around us was very real and in fact is happening and is happening against our consent and against the contractual obligations of the province that they have with us. But just but, so I understand uh, this, Chief LaRocca, you, you basically mm -hmm. lost the right to operate this casino and you do realize some revenues from it, but you're not in charge of it anymore. Fair to say? Yes, we have a lease uh, agreement, a host agreement, as do other host municipalities and as well a revenue share. Uh, we, we allowed to... Um, we allowed the OLG to conduct and manage that gaming for us for a certain uh, time period of the lease. And then we retain all rights to gaming in our territory after that time. So nothing has been given away in that regard. But um, we entered that modernization plan again as a way of survival because, because of the Great Blue Heron being the lifeblood to our community. We need people and we need patrons to come out to our First Nation and enjoy our, all that we have to offer. And, uh, take part in our economy and it's it's absolutely essential to the survival of our community. Well, here's the bottom line question, of course, and that is, is there enough gambling going on in the province of Ontario today that would enable those who want to do it online and those who want to go to a bricks and mortar casino to kind of survive happily together? And in other words, is there enough business out there for everybody? Yes. Indeed. We commissioned a, uh, a cannibalization report way back when, when we were looking at uh, 
at modernization back in 2014. And uh, it was very clear then that the province's plan was to oversaturate the market. Since the advent of modernization and signing on to those gaming agreements with them, they've in fact opened new casinos and not closed other casinos that they said that they would. So the market is even more saturated than we anticipated it to be. Um, I don't know if you've watched commercials on uh, Saturday, if you watch Saturday Night Live, the OLG is very much involved in advertising to uh, advertising its online platform. And uh, I think that it's it's going to you know be quite enough. And, and quite frankly, I'm open to understanding the data around gaming, the iGaming regime, but I do uh, I do need to see it in order to, to understand it. And so far, the province has shared nothing. Oh, uh, look, uh, um, Austin Matthews, I saw him doing a commercial the other day for internet gambling. This stuff is everywhere. I remember a time in, uh, where you, you, you weren't even allowed to buy an Irish sweepstakes ticket in this province, and now, of course, gambling is absolutely everywhere. But let's find out more about the impact that, that this may have on you uh, if your concerns uh, come to be true. Uh, how, how many jobs do you think First Nations people have lost since you lost control of Great Blue Heron? Well, certainly our, our members um, have lost jobs since the changeover. Uh, we were once the lar second largest employer in the Durham region, and now uh, we're definitely not that. I think it went from around 1,100 jobs to about 250 at this time. Certainly the pandemic hasn't helped, but at the same time, they're opening uh, Casino Pickering, or they've opened it, uh, and they've remained, They've kept open uh, Ajax Downs, and uh, they're continuing to proliferate other facilities, such as in Kawartha. So I'm uh, very nervous about uh, the impact that uh, that um, modernization has had on jobs for First Nations people, not only our own people here at Scugog First Nation, but other First Nations persons that are in the urban Indigenous community who live in and around this area, or other Indigenous persons from the local area First Nations that are close by. So, you know, certainly, um, you know, the, the government is going forward. They're not requiring iGaming operators to hire Ontarians to create jobs here in the province. The current uh, approach doesn't create any jobs whatsoever. It, in fact, takes them away. So, you know, I, um, I really... Uh, I'm deeply concerned about the uh, the level of opportunity that Ontarians are going to have, and certainly First Nations people. And again, let's understand what the impact will be here. We're talking now fewer jobs for First Nations people. We're talking potentially lower revenues for you as well. What are the consequences yes. of that that you see down the road? Well, I, I think we're going to have a, um, issues with... Uh, the continued building of community infrastructure. Right now, we've just finally got off our boil water advisory in December 2021, but we're looking to expand wastewater so as to help the community and protect the lake and the environment. Projects like that are going to be impacted, not only the initial capital build, but the operations and maintenance of such projects. So, you know, in addition, to, to the funds distributed by the province. Our community as well has donated more than $35 million to municipalities and other organizations across the Durham region. We've, uh, through our donations committee, our community has also assisted thousands of individuals from newborn to end of life in, in all aspects of assistance for issues of hardship or illness. Um, our donations have built um, hospitals uh, arenas, women's shelters, municipal buildings, libraries, and many other organizations in Durham Region, uh, the adverse impact of iGaming will be felt directly by the municipalities and local charities and the people they serve. And let's just understand this again, because your First Nation is, what, like you're an hour, hour and a half away from this studio, and you've had boil water advisories. I mean, that's pretty shocking, is it not? Uh, definitely. <laughs> Most people are very shocked to learn of that. And our community water infrastructure was extremely old and outdated and, and was not doing the job to appropriately treat the water and keep it safe for our community like all other, all other Ontarians and Canadians across the country. So we wanted to uh, get up to a level of, a, you know, a, a minimum standard. Uh, so we're meeting provincial standards or exceeding them. And I'm very proud of that on behalf of our First Nation. Um, but again, that takes money. So while we did uh, receive, you know, in and around, uh, I think it was 4.3 or 4.5 million dollars from uh, Indigenous Services Canada, and we also uh, 
were a successful applicant for the small communities fund, we've out of out of our say a twenty million dollar project, we've spent I would say um, I think it's fourteen million of our own money. Hmm. Okay, and you've so put your right. You've put your concerns on the record here. I wonder how. I mean, have you been able to talk to anybody in the premier's office about this? Have you been able to talk to a cabinet minister about this? How have you? How have you officially made your concerns known to government? Uh, we have submitted the, the standard form um, requests for comments that are put out by the government to all Ontarians, but uh, it's very, um, no one really knows where it ends up going. And often you're not uh, responded to except to say that they confirm receipt. Uh, we have made numerous requests for consultation um, from the uh, from the Ontario government and uh, and its agencies to discuss our concerns and uh, our want for meaningful consultation and accommodation. And uh, honestly, we've received none. We had one meeting with uh, with some bureaucrats there to discuss their thinking around how iGaming is going to open up a, a potentiality for for a new market space. Really, I just see that as uh, as spearheading the youth. But I digress. We can talk about that in a minute. But I, um, I have not received any meaningful consultation from the government, though it has been, I'd say, three years in the making, where I've been trying to speak to the government about its gaming agenda in general, uh, as well about its uh, um, building of, of course, p casino pickering, its plans for other casinos, and uh, more recently, this iGaming issue. Um, so it's been deeply disappointing. I don't know quite... Uh, where to go from here, though, of course, we're assessing our options. I think the biggest um, the biggest issue with it all, in my view, is that the government just forces First Nations to continually have to resort to uh, looking at other options, such as court, than actually sitting down and talking with us. It, it, it really just uh, reduces um, the uh, rhetoric around reconciliation to a joke. Well, you anticipated my next question, which is, do you plan to sue somebody about this? Uh, we're looking into our options right now, and uh, certainly I see I see um, options out there with respect to the constitutional arguments that uh, or duties that are owed, uh, as well as contractual ones. So, uh, unfortunately, we have to consider that as as a route. And I know that other First Nations across Ontario are doing the same, and and in other spaces uh, as well. Um, it's uh, it's it's really deeply disappointing because, of course, the federal government back in uh, I think it was 1985 and maybe even prior in 1979, signed over an agreement with the province saying that it would give um, uh, the administration basically of gaming, the conduct and management of gaming as a monopoly to the provinces. And so it completely shut out First Nations from engaging in that conversation. And now since obviously since that time in around 1985, the law has changed a great deal. So, um, you know, certainly that would not be legal now. <laughs> for them to, to right. do that. Well, this is one of these sort of typically Canadian situations where, yes, the province has jurisdiction over casinos and gaming, but on the other hand, you're a First Nation, and First Nations deal on a nation-to-nation -nation basis with the government of Canada. So I do wonder whether they have a role to play on your behalf as it relates to trying to get some time at Queen's Park on this file for you. What do you think? Indeed, they do. I mean, I, I have spoken very briefly with Mr. Lametti, who... Um, the Justice you know, Minister. Yes. Who? Thank you. Who? Um, he basically said he, if we could get to a table with the province, that he would be willing to sit and uh, and engage. But that was the limit to his involvement. And I think there's a lot more that can and should be done by the, the by the federal government to um, basically break up the monopoly and make right what was what was made wrong in the 80s. Um, you know, and and certainly you know to your to your earlier question, that kind of unilateral decision making in silence of the Ford government is inevitably going to lead us to the courts. It's just, it's just uh, a question of when and and whether or not they'll actually come to the table in good faith and meet with us. Hmm. I got thirty seconds left here, Chief. I wonder if, um, sort of from the school of if you can't beat them, join them. Why don't you get into the iGaming gaming business yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly we've looked at that from a from an OLG modernization standpoint. When, when back in 2014, when modernization was announced, they were uh, saying, you know, look, uh, we're going to put you out of business. We will surround you. We will attack your gaming license. We will pull the slot machines if need be. 
this is not something we're willing to entertain. If you want to get into modernization with us and become uh, and, you know, a stakeholder, then we are more than interested. So after protracted negotiations, we came to uh, to an agreement that we we have retained that nation to nation, government to government relationship through, as the underpinning, it's the underbelly of our agreements and uh, and as well, the underbelly to all the contractual commercial agreements that we have with OLG as well. Um, it hasn't worked out that great for us. <laughs> They're still going ahead and steamrolling uh, with or without us. And I, um, and so I'm, I'm looking at eye gaming with some uh, amount of, of real skepticism. However, it's not to say that our community wouldn't engage in such, in such a way. I just need to understand the data and what they're doing about responsible gaming, because quite frankly, everyone's living room is open for gaming now. I see no plan, no transparency around responsible gaming. In fact, the land-based casinos have far more um, interested strategies and, and, and frameworks around responsible gaming that are that are legislated by the HCO, and they employ them in their casinos every day. So, what is it that they're going to do for iGaming? I'm not quite sure about that. Hmm. That's Kelly Laraca. Chief of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. We appreciate you coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views about this. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. And that is the agenda for Thursday, March 17th, 2022. When March break ends and the kids return to class next week, schools will be operating as they haven't in almost two years. Tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka looks at what to expect with the end of student mask mandates. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And Nam, we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.